Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I see we, we've got uh, almost 100 people online and um, we'll get started here. So um, thank you for joining us for our third Special Support Parent Forum on reopening. My name is Dan Milgate, the Superintendent of Schools. And I'd like to introduce you to our team that will be joining us today. Uh, over to my far left, I have Ty Zinkovich, our Assistant Superintendent of Instruction. Um, I have Mr. Tim O'Connor. He is our Director of Student Services. To my right, uh, Megan Sarkis is one of our parents. She was on our uh, facility uh, on our reopening task force. And all the way to the right is Corey Allen. He's our, he's got to get in the picture a little bit there. He's our chief information officer. And, um, and he also uh, was one of the uh, task force co-chairs for us for reopening. Uh, does a lot with our computers, our connectivity, making sure all that's well. And then finally, Jonathan Salzberg behind me, he's our uh, executive director of operations and special project and also one of our reopening task force chairs. Um, I don't see her yet, but Ms. Blosser is our interpreter today with us. So she should be popping on shortly uh, for our interpreting services. So what I'd, what I'd like to do is thank our district-wide reopening task force members the Board of Education and our administrative team for their tireless efforts in working on these plans. As you know, details and logistics continue to be developed and adjustments made uh, based on any new requirements that we receive from the Department of Health or the Department of Education or the Governor's Office. Additionally, while we continue to provide Friday updates from the district and from each of our schools, we have also been making a coordinated effort to individually respond to questions, and inquiries we receive from all of you. Uh, you will hear today how guidelines have changed even since Monday with the Department of Health and our work with developing our daily health screening application this past week. As I shared during our introductions, a number of the task force members are here with us today. A huge thank you to Megan Sarkis for joining us as one of our parent representatives. And what I'd like to do is at this time, Megan, uh, wanted to share some of her perspective and her experience with, uh, with an update on the uh, work of the task force. Megan. Thank you, Mr. Milgate. Being a member of the task force really allowed me the opportunity to see all the complexities that go into the decision making for this academic year. The task force members represented a wide group of stakeholders and departments to ensure that all populations were represented and had a voice at the table. I truly felt that my perspective, not only as a parent, but as a full-time working parent, was welcomed and valued during these important discussions. In addition, responses from parent and family surveys and the enrollment intent forms helped to guide the work of the task force subcommittees. Concerns and suggestions from families were heard and addressed at every stage. And while I realize that this is not a one-size-fits-all solution, I want to assure fellow parents that every consideration was made to ensure the health and safety of our children while not compromising the high quality education we've come to expect as Spencerport parents. This learning situation, I understand, is not ideal for anyone this fall, but I have every confidence in our district administrators that they continue to have the best interests of our children as their highest priority. And I know a lot of you still have questions that remain and the district has been working tirelessly through those questions daily. And finally, one thing that's been abundantly clear to me throughout this process is that as we know, this situation can change daily, sometimes hourly. And as parents, it's our ability to adapt and have faith in our district leaders and teachers that will determine our success as parents to our children as they continue to navigate this complex educational environment. Thank you, Megan. So with that, uh, again, I want to thank each of you for reaching out to us with questions uh, for those that have sent them in. And I also want to thank our administrative team, especially the principals, for their continued commitment to this as well, as they've been reaching out separately to many of you to answer your questions as well. Uh, we've been collating these questions since Monday and updating our frequently asked question page on our website. Um, and as the administrators are reaching out to you, we're trying to cross references to make sure we've answered all these questions. Um, we will continue to do that. And for the weeks coming, we'll continue to build on our frequently asked uh, page. We can move to the uh, agenda. Hello, Ms. Blosser.
Thank you, Mr. Allen. Uh, the purpose of these forums is to continue to provide everyone with as much information as possible. Our forums will uh, we're basically been one hour each with three 20 minute segments divided as follows, as you can see on the screen. Uh, we, we've been pri providing an update with wherever we're at at this point. Uh, then what we do is we take all the questions that have been sent in to us in advance and then prepare answers for those with my colleagues here. And then finally, at the last part of it, we'll have a chance to respond to as many questions as you put in towards the end of the, the session in the uh, chat feature on uh, the Zoom program here. So our goal is to get through all the questions posed today. And if we are not able to do that, a lot, we will once again do what we said earlier. We'll take those questions. We'll make sure we lend them in on our website answers and or have one of our administrators reach out to you. So uh, second, if you look at our webpage, this is the frequently asked questions page. This already looks different since this morning. Again, because as we refine our answers to questions and keep working on different systems and so on, we clean that up. So uh, that's up there for your review and we encourage you to go to that. And then the final reminder is that um, while this is our final um, session for today, uh, you go to the next page there, Mr. L. Uh, we do have one final forum next week, and we designed this one to be with the principals from the schools uh, to have representation at elementary and secondary. So because some of you don't have kids in both programs, we've set it up with a 10 minute transition so that if you want to go to one section or the other, you can. And we're going to do our best to modify our presentation around that. That's from 6 to 8 p.m. So to begin our session today, I would like to share some general comments first with respect to the work we need to do to complete in the coming weeks before we open schools for our students and staff. Please know that our number one priority is absolutely the safety of all members of our learning community. And to that end, we will be providing answers to many of the questions that were posed around our protocols and systems that have we been, we've been putting in place with respect to, to safety. With so many procedures being developed, another key area of focus for us is going to be the training and the workshops around that, informational learning videos uh, that we're developing to make sure that we're uh, uh, preparing people for coming into the buildings, even the visitors and, and, and the students and staff. So uh, a good example is a major reason we changed our first week of school to the four conference days is to ensure that we have the time needed to do this with our staff and, and with our uh, faculty. Along with that, we've been working with the administrative team on putting in extra supervision requirements and reinforcements uh, efforts needed for this time. Many of the questions that you have posed are related to these efforts and you will hear more about that today. So I'm gonna have Mr. Allen go back to our PowerPoint. I wanna thank our team of administrators and faculty that have been coordinating the student and faculty actors we have and some of the presentations that we've made for you and little vignettes. So let's take a look at an example of some of the things we're doing to try to help people be prepared for the opening of school. Physical layouts of all classrooms have been redesigned to provide social distancing among a reduced number of students. To start the year, each room will accommodate a limited number of students per class. Each desk will face the same direction and will be spaced roughly six feet apart in proximity. Additional items that are not critical to learning have also been removed. Students will also wear masks while working at their desks. However, a teacher may choose to provide brief mask breaks. So we plan to have a series of these, including uh, vignettes around uh, entering into the buildings and, and hallway movement and transportation and hygiene and cafeteria, you get the idea. And um, again, um, this is a way to help us in advance of people coming into the school district to know what it's gonna look like and what to expect. Um, one of those most frequently asked questions that we received this past week was really answered with the remote and hybrid group placements announced last Friday. 
Parents may find those placements in the campus backpack section of our Infinite Campus Parent Portal. Once we received all the enrollment intent forms last Monday and, and beginning on Tuesday, we needed a few days to run those groups in Infinite Campus, which you can uh, should have received last Friday. If you need assistance with how to access these pages, tutorials may be found on the main page of our website, along with the contact information for individuals that will provide support. In addition, any individual questions you should, you should, that you have should be directed to your building principals. Please remember that while we are reviewing the extenuating circumstances with grouping placements with our principals, our decisions are really influenced by maintaining a balanced level of students in our classrooms and buses with safety and social distancing in mind that I mentioned a little bit earlier. Related to that common question, another question that's really been asked quite a bit is around the ability to change from a full remote model to a hybrid model or from a hybrid to a full remote model prior to that October 30th date that we have set. Again, to ensure the student safety and staff safety, our classrooms and buses are balanced at this point the best we can and to support social distancing with that in mind, unless a situation is truly extenuating and we can still meet those guidelines, we will not be able to honor changes from remote to hybrid. Uh, for those requests to go from full remote to hybrid, and um, they will be, um, I'm sorry, to go to hybrid to remote uh, will be easier for us to, to process. Um, as we move into this next segment of the forum, I want to thank you again for submitting your questions in advance. Uh, because many of the questions you submitted are very similar, we will focus on answering those questions first. To begin with, since so many of our questions revolved around the availability of technology and the use of these resources in our hybrid and remote models, um, we wanted to answer some of those questions first. So what I'd like to do is introduce Corey Allen again, who will run through some important updates regarding our connectivity and resources and we'll address many of the questions in this area. To begin with though, he's going to provide an example of how quickly our information changes. So he's gonna share with you our daily health screening tool that since Monday in our first forum, um, we now have a demonstration that's available that we've put together of what that will look like. Mr. Allen. Thank you very much, Mr. Melgate. So what I'm going to do is I'm gonna run through in um, just a quick overview of the Qualtrics screening that will be made available to students and faculty as a means of a, a daily health screening. So what you have up on your screen right now is um, text that will come in the form of an email and a text message to parents of students throughout the district. So each student across the district will have a unique email link. So this is similar, but not exact. I'll point out one difference because this is just a preview mode, but this is the first page, just an introduction to what the, um, what the expectations and what the screening is. You will not need to provide an email address as this will come to your email address. Again, this is just one of the unique pieces uh, for the, for the um, preview. First question, are you gonna be on campus today? I am gonna be on campus today. I will answer yes. If I answer no, it will take me to the end of the screen. This is just um, validating my phone number. Do you currently have chills or a fever greater than 100 degrees Fahrenheit? Again, if I say yes, it is gonna take me to the end of the screener I am not going to be certified to come onto campus today, and I will also receive information on what I should do as a parent for next step for the health and welfare of my child. If I, if I click no, that I don't have a fever or chills, I'm then moved on to the next series of questions. This is very important. As we look at the, as we look at the um, heading of the question, have you had any of the following symptoms since your last screening or in the last 24 hours that are new or unusual to you? In that section, new or unusual to you is important in the fact that we're going to address many questions today in regards to seasonal allergies, known sicknesses, 
and those uh, symptoms that might be comparable to those of COVID-19. So I looked through my list of symptoms. Clicking on any one of these is going to tell me that I'm not certified to come onto campus today. And then again, give me the next actions that I should take as a parent. So I'm gonna hit none of the above. When I click none of the above, you will see that I've been approved to come in to campus today. Just very quickly, if I restart our experience, and I just click through the questions that I've already, that I have already um, shown you, to really a very important question around my temperature, and I click yes, I do in fact have a fever, greater than 100 degrees. Have you been tested for COVID-19 in the past seven days? I have not. And then this is gonna show me that I am not certified to come onto campus today and to please stay home, all right? Also, it, it asks me to stay home and contact my physician as well as the um, local department of health and even gives me a link to do so, all right? So just, again, as a reminder, what will happen as we start to roll this out to not only our staff and students as early as next week for uh, more testing, parents will receive an email alert as well as a text alert each and every day. And the screener must be completed at home prior to students either being dropped off to, at school or being sent on the bus. All right, we again are gonna address some of those questions later on today in the Q&A, but we are really hoping that through this web-based platform, students arriving at school will have already been tested and are cleared and certified to be on campus that day. So going back now to some of the frequently asked questions revolving around technology. First, we have a question in regards to student laptops. Are all students getting upgraded laptops? Students at K-5 will be asked to return their current laptops in exchange for updated devices. So if students in K-5 received a device in the spring, we're gonna ask them to bring that back onto campus and have that swapped out for a newer and refreshed device. Student entering, students entering six and nine will also receive updated laptops as those are our points of contact for replacements where grades seven, eight, 10, 11, and 12 will keep their existing assi assigned devices. Now distribution schedules for not only remote students, but also hybrid students will be announced by building principals in the weeks to come. Is Wi-Fi available for remote instructional days? Yes, the district is currently working with families who indicated on the enrollment intent form that they do not have Wi-Fi in their homes. Computer services team is working with those families to ensure that they have that um, connectivity before the first day of school. Will students need a printer at home? No, the majority of the work that will be assigned will be in digital format and there will not be a need for a printer. Will new laptops be issued to eighth grade students? No, again, at grades six and nine, we will distribute new laptops. Again, those are our touch points for distributing brand new devices for students. Would the district put the link to the technology help desk on the home page, please? Families can contact the help desk at 349-5106, and this number has been added to the district homepage. And while we received many um, questions in regards to technology, really those there were variations of those questions that I just shared with you. Thank you, Mr. Milgan. Thank you, sir. Uh, next, Jonathan Salzberg will share some of the important questions that were posed that involve our operations departments, uh, like the general safety programs, protocols, lunch programs, transportation, and masking. Jonathan? Thank you, Mr. Milgate. Okay. Uh, as he stated, we have received a number of questions that affect departments under the operations umbrella. Um, for instance, we received a few questions about cleaning, barriers, and social distancing, which I will address first. There was a question, does the district have enough supplies on hand to meet requirements for a period of time? Cleaning supplies, staff PPE, and other disinfected materials. 
Our parent survey indicated that 98% of parents will be able to provide a face covering for their child. Though we have this data, we are following SED guidance and have ordered an eight week supply of needed PPE for students and staff relevant to their positions. And these items are already arriving. The district also has cleaning supplies and hand sanitizer on hand to supply the buildings through December. Another question, I understand there's a deep cleaning on Wednesdays, but what about between the two groups, between Monday and Tuesday? Rather than attempt to limit cleaning to one deep clean on Wednesday, we will be doing a deep clean every evening. The cleaning staff will circulate through the building and disinfect the touch surfaces, such as desks and doorknobs, using a disinfectant spray or, or an electrostatic sprayer or a similar method. Cleaning staff will also circulate through the building cleaning high touch surfaces and restrooms periodically through the day and in the evening when the building is empty. Will there be plexiglass in between student desks? Furniture will be arranged so that six feet of social distancing is maintained in all directions, including between student desks and the teacher's desk. The district has ordered clear plastic barriers for use if it is determined that an enrolled class size requires desk closer than six feet and barriers for use across elementary student tables. What steps have you taken to ensure social distancing is maintained in the hallways, especially during class transitions or in high traffic areas? Floor decals with arrows, bright tape, and distance reminders, along with posters and signage, will be placed throughout our buildings to guide travel patterns and encourage social spacing. Next up, we did receive a, a number of questions uh, about masks and face coverings, um, including the expectations of all staff and students to wear masks. I would also note that in our website FAQ, we have already indicated that masks will be required at all times, even during instruction. First question is, how will mask wearing be enforced? Is this going to be enforced just as the standard dress code? We are currently updating our code of conduct and its adoption is pending board approval. The district intends to offer trainings about mask expectations and reinforcement when staff report back to work and in the initial days of return to school. Will students be given and staff be given mask breaks and what will that look like? We understand the importance of mass breaks and are currently working on plans for implementation. Once established, we will make sure we provide training for staff and students about breaks and ensure we are still adhering to the information from the Department of Health. We will keep you updated as we know more. Will students wear masks in physical education? Yes, students will be required to wear masks during physical education and they will have the opportunity for mass breaks periodically during the class. PE classes scheduled outside will allow for more flexibility in those mask breaks. Will face shields be permitted in place of face coverings in order to provide a break once seated and socially distanced? No. Current guidance from the New York State Department of Health is that a face shield is insufficient to protect the wearer from exposure without a proper face covering. Similarly, a face shield is considered insufficient to protect others without a suitable face covering. That being said, face shields will be allowed when used over an acceptable face covering. Do classrooms, hallways, I apologize, next up, we uh, had additional questions about HVAC and ventilation in our buildings. Do classrooms, hallways, gymnasiums all have HVAC systems that meet the new standards? The New York Department of Health guidance provided to the district only indicates that we should increase outside air as much as possible while maintaining health and safety protocols. The district has evaluated all HVAC systems and those systems will be set to maximize fresh air intake for the outside temperatures. Do all windows open and will they be open to assist with ventilation? Most classrooms across the district have functional windows in which staff are encouraged to improve ventilation unless this introduces a health and safety risk, such as allergies or a potential fall. Will the use of fans be permitted in the fall? Our current understanding is that fans may only be used to exhaust air to the outside and not as a means of blowing air across people as this could spread the virus. However, we have submitted this question to the New York State Department of Education for further guidance. Next up, we have two questions on the transportation. When will be, when will be 
notified of the school bus schedules. The transportation department is currently creating the school bus routes and the times will be communicated when the bus passes are sent out. This process has been delayed due to the creation of the hybrid system student get groupings. We will get these out as soon as possible. Will remote families be able to request bus transportation in October if changing to hybrid or full in-person instruction? Yes, we will be developing a survey or process in early October for parents to complete, allowing enough time for our transportation department to balance and reroute as needed. And finally, there were a couple questions regarding lunches and lunch rooms, especially at the middle school and with respect to seating and spacing. Each building is laying out furniture to maximize student seating while still maintaining six feet of social distancing in all directions. This will affect each building differently. For example, at the high school, the plan is to have seating in the West Cafeteria and the West Gymnasium so as to have enough seating during the lunch period. The middle school will use the cafeteria and seats will be spaced six feet apart and clearly marked for students. At the elementary level, the buildings are laying out tables and reconsidering lunch time so that students will be able to eat lunch in the cafeteria. In all places, students will be able to speak to one another, but spacing will remain at six feet so barriers would not be required. Thank you, Mr. Uh, thank you, Jonathan. So our uh, next area is about the health and safety of our students and the scheduling process and the protocols uh, that we're influenced by from the Department of Health. So uh, Mr. O'Connor is going to share some of that information with you. Great. Thank you, Mr. Melgate. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, as we mentioned during the community forum on Monday, we certainly appreciate all of the thoughtful questions from the community focused on the safety and health of our students. Uh, we also appreciate the opportunity to answer them this afternoon. Uh, as we ha have engaged in conversations with the reopening task force and other members of our learning community, uh, we certainly have seen themes around health and safety questions. Uh, we have made an effort to answer those common questions on our website. Our hope is to provide further clarity on questions that were posed at the forum on Monday and also the questions that we have received throughout the week. Additionally, uh, since our last forum, we have received additional guidance from the County Health Department, and I will capture this new information uh, in our response to some of the commonly asked questions. Uh, as Mr. Allen had shared at the beginning of the forum, uh, we have received a number of questions about the symptoms and the symptoms related to COVID-19 and the impact on individuals who may have uh, or be symptomatic. Uh, so the first question really uh, is aligned and targeted to the question around symptoms. Uh, so the question is, what happens when a, a student or a staff member uh, has seasonal allergies, uh, exhibits a running nose or a cough, but does not exhibit any other symptoms consistent with COVID-19? When a case like that, we really have to look at, our, at the state guidance and the Mineral County Department of Health guidance. Uh, and that indicates that when a student or staff member presents with symptoms consistent with COVID-19, either during a health screen or when the student um, presents with symptoms requiring a, a visit to the school nurse office, unless the district has documentation from a provider regarding a chronic illness that aligns to those symptoms, uh, the child or staff member must be isolated and sent home. Uh, so therefore, if there is not documentation of a chronic illness, uh, the child is required to be sent home. And that then the child could not return to school without, at minimum, documentation from a healthcare provider, a negative COVID-19 test, and also symptom resolution. So similar, we've received questions about what happens or what is the, the process if a teacher or a student tests positive for COVID-19. Uh, and, and once again, we rely heavily on our partnership with the Monroe County Department of Public Health. Uh, if we were to receive that unfortunate news that a student or staff member were, were, test, were to test positive for COVID-19, it is the County Health Department that will take the lead uh, on the school district's response to a positive test. Obviously, we would collaborate with the Department of Health on matters such as contact tracing, quarantine, and isolation efforts, but it is the Department of Health that will respond and perform a thorough investigation for that confirmed case. Uh, this includes evaluating each COVID-19 positive case on a case-by-case -case basis uh, and providing recommendations to the district regarding a plan of action. Those recommendations could include, but obviously are not limited to, an immediate closure of a classroom, 
a school building, or the district for 24 hours or more. The Department of Health will notify the superintendent or designated personnel for all mandatory quarantines for students, staff, and faculty only after notifying those individuals and families first. Some of the new guidance from the County Health Department this week was around medical exemptions for students wearing masks, so I'd like to address that next. So the question reads, will my child be able to receive a medical exemption from wearing a mask? A new mask exemption form has been developed by the Monroe County Department of Public Health this week. Uh, it is currently being distributed to physicians in an effort to provide consistency in the Finger Lakes region. It can only be completed by a New York State licensed physician, a physician's assistant, or a licensed clinical psychologist. Currently, the acceptable diagnosis to justify a mass exemption include a previously documented neuromuscular disorder that makes it difficult for the child to remove a mask themselves, a child with a previously diagnosed severe de developmental or behavioral problem, or a child with a diagnosis of serious emotional disturbance or with other significant mental health problems currently in the care of a behavioral health team, and it is believed that by this team, wearing a mask would lead to worsening emotional harm. If the district were to receive this form from a physician, it will be reviewed and accepted or not accepted based upon the district's medical director. So in addition to uh, questions around health and safety, we've also received some questions around student schedules. So I'd like to describe the process that was used for dividing students into our blue learning groups and our gold learning group. So the question is, what was the process used to create the blue and gold groups in the hybrid learning model? So as you recall, the district sent out an enrollment intent form, and it was the results of that enrollment intent form that was used to determine our students who have selected the remote learning option and then the hybrid model. So once our remote learning students were identified, and we had also placed our students in the Spencerport group and the Ranger group based upon their academic program, this left the students that needed to be scheduled into the blue and gold hybrid groups. We then used Infinite Campus to balance these groups and to keep siblings in the same household together so that they had the opportunity to attend school on the same day. To do this, Infinite Campus balanced each seat in each course section or classroom. And if a family had siblings in multiple schools, it was the oldest siblings schedule that would be balanced first. And this could be up to eight sections that would need to be balanced at the secondary level. And then younger students were attached and then balanced from there. Uh, this was done in an effort to maintain smaller groups to assist with the district in adhering to the social distance guidelines, uh, social distance guidelines within the classroom and the school bus. So once again, we appreciate the questions from our community, uh, and we ask that you please continue to reference the frequently asked section of the website. Thank you, Mr. Milgate. Yeah, thank you, Mr. O'Connor. All right, finally, Mr. Zankowitz, our Assistant Superintendent for Instruction, he will uh, provide a summary of the questions asked that were related to our instructional program and the delivery of services in the hybrid and remote learning models. Um, we know this is a large part of the work that we have to continue to do, and we're diligently working on that with our administrative team and our teachers union on some important details with our instructional models. Thank you, Mr. Milgate. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, my portion of the presentation is gonna be divided into four different parts. To provide a quick overview of where we stand from an instructional standpoint. I'll provide some information about our remote learning approach also provide information on the hybrid model. And last but not least, I'll provide some updates on our students with disability. So to provide you that overall perspective of where we stand right now, you know that what we do in terms of our curriculum, we have to adhere to maps in order to ensure that all of our students are on the same page. So it doesn't matter if a student selects the hybrid model or remote model, they need to be on the same page. We know though that with instruction, it's gonna look a little bit different. We're very, very fortunate that we have such talented teachers here on Spencerport who are able to deliver that instruction to support your children. 
And last but not least, one of the main differences from the spring to the 2021 school year involves assessment. You may recall back in the spring, we simply provided feedback and not necessarily getting grades to your child. This will change for this year as we assess their progress for the school year, as we then provide parents that feedback via the quarterly or trimester report cards. So Mr. O'Connor mentioned um, how we were able to devise the blue and gold groups. Now we started off with the individuals that selected the remote learning option. Currently as it stands, we have about 15% of our parents selected this option for remote learning. Question was asked about the school hours, if those will remain the same. The answer is yes. The high school will continue to start at 725 in the morning and end at 210 in the afternoon. Cosgrove's day will begin at 8 a.m. and conclude at 2.50 p.m. And at the elementary level, schools will continue to start at 9 a.m. and end at 3.30. Some questions were posed about our transition years, specifically kindergarten, sixth, and ninth grade, what those orientations will look like. There will be a combination of both live and virtual options. So the week of August 31st, We'll take our sixth grade orientation and our freshman orientation will take place. Mr. Santola and Mr. McKay will be providing information about those two orientations. Obviously, we're going to have more frequent, higher numbers of orientation or to maintain the social distancing, but there'll also be a virtual component as well. For our kindergarten orientation, that also will be in person. And the elementary principals will be providing information to those incoming kindergarten students and their families, what it will look like, but ASIP families with kindergartners hold September 10th, Friday, September 11th on your calendars, as those when those two dates will take place. The question was asked, will hybrid and remote students have the same teacher for instruction? At the elementary level, they will not have the same instructor, but at the secondary level, they may have the same teacher. Now, as we provide some more information about remote learning, the question was asked, will remote students have specific times to be on a Zoom for a live teaching during the school day? The answer is yes, and the answer is no. It is yes because we're providing that live, synchronous opportunity for all of our students, but we also understand we have to plan for equity, so we know that some students will not be able to watch a lesson or engage with a teacher through synchronous approach. As a result, we'll store some information, we'll upload these tutorials, lessons, instructional materials, et cetera, in our school to resource for your child to access. So will remote students be able to get help or tutoring with the teacher if needed? Yes, they will. We're also working on specific times and dates when students will be able to access their teacher throughout the confines of the day. Now you heard me mention a couple of terms Synchronous and asynchronous learning. I'm going to ask Mr. Allen just to provide a slide that provides a quick overview of the differences between the two. So as you can see, synchronous means live instruction, so students learn at the same time. Communication happens in real time, and it's our hope that it's more engaging and effective for our students based on their learning experience. We also know, like I mentioned earlier, that we have to provide flexibility and convenience for students that may not be able to jump on a Zoom or work with their teacher during a set period of time. This is called asynchronous instruction where students learn at different times within the confines of the day. For the hybrid model, as we make that transition, we wanted to start off with showing the students' schedules. So as you can see here, this is the K-5 schedule for our hybrid learners. First day of instruction will begin on Monday, September 14th, and that will be an A day for our students. Those students are in the blue group, obviously will be recording that day, and they will follow their traditional day, follow English, writing, math, etc. And at the elementary level, we follow a five day rotation, A through E. We offer specials during those times, that's why that letter day is important for that special rotation. 
Within that five day rotation, students receive physical education twice on two days, art on one day, music on one day, and a combination of either work with their instructional, sorry, enrichment specialist in computer use or the school librarian on literacy. Now you'll notice that Wednesdays, there's no days designated. That would be a perfect opportunity for us to provide special instruction for our students. But as you can see, the days for the students when they're in attendance would be A day on the 14th for the blue group. And then when they return to school on Thursday, September 17th, it will be a B day. It will continue to go through the schedule over the first three weeks of the school year. Those three days when students are not in session, they will receive virtual instruction, asynchronous instruction, and synchronous instruction based on their particular needs and based on the curriculum maps that we establish. Moving to middle school level, the middle school also follows a five-day rotation, and you will see that new learning takes place each and every day. New learning will occur first day would be in the A day, Monday, September 14th, B day, Tuesday the 15th, C day, Thursday the 17th. And you can go all the way through. You'll notice that E days are designated E1 and E2. That's just for some of our unique specials that we offer in a different rotation. Once again, Wednesdays are not assigned a letter day, but we have a responsibility to provide instruction for our students on these days, and that will vary from student to student, class to class. Last but not least, at the high school level, we follow a four-day rotation. You'll see here that the blue group during that first week of school will be in their A and B day classes. A occurring on September 14th, B occurring on September 17th. And then that second week on those same days, it's C and D day rotation. The reason why we did this is to ensure that students work with all their teachers at least once through live instruction on any given week knowing that physical education, science, and a couple of other smaller classes occur on a different rotation. If I was to go back to the elementary level, in terms of that blue and gold group, a question might be asked, what will happen on that first day of school on Monday, September 14th, if my child's in the gold group? We'll defer instruction to the following day because we know that some students will not have access to a laptop at that point. Mr. Allen and his team have devised an approach to distribute laptops to our K-5 learners and any other student that hasn't received one to this date. This includes both our remote students and our hybrid students. So it will be completely one-to-one -one across the entire school district. Kindergarten and first graders will be expected to keep their laptops at home for the days when they're learning from home. And we'll ask our students in grades two through five to bring their laptops from home to school each day that they're assigned to come to school. In addition, we'll not be requiring an insurance payment for our K through five students, knowing that once we return to school for full instruction, once we return back to normal, that those devices will be returned to the building, will be remain at the building. Now, if I was to continue with the hybrid model questions, uh, will kids stay in their classrooms for instruction and teachers move from class to class? This will occur, sorry, students will remain in their class at the elementary level and their special area teacher will travel to their classroom. Students at the secondary level will travel from class to class. Will students have band and chorus at the secondary level? Yes, they will. We will utilize the auditorium at both Cosgrove and the high school and ensure that we can maintain social distancing of at least 12 feet. Uh, question was asked, what is the status for students that attend Wilmoco? Uh, Wilmoco will be offered, will be offering a hybrid model of instruction to begin the school year. Students who have chosen the hybrid model for Spenceport will attend Wilmoco in person five days out of the 10. 
The other days will be remote distance learning. If students want to attend remotely, that is an option for them as well. It will be an AM session and a PM session like a normal school year. Students will have the option of driving to Wamoko in their personal vehicles. This will occur only for the 2021 school year or while we're still under this model. Once we return to full return, that driving option will no longer be available. Uh, relative to the drop off and pickup, will children be able to arrive to school early? We're trying to minimize that in order to ensure that we can properly supervise all of our students. This question, along with many other questions, will be posted on each building's webpage over the coming days. The six principals are currently collaborating on a common approach, and our hope is to post this next week. Last question before we move on to special education. What's the process for remote students to receive school materials such as books, packets, and worksheets? The district will make every effort to limit the amount of tangible materials as much as possible, and we'll schedule times through the principals for pickup. Transitioning to special education, if a student with an IEP in a general education classroom has an adult support for instructional purposes, will they have access to their assigned adult on days they are not in school? Students will have access to their special education teachers and related service providers in school and virtually based on their individual needs as outlined on their IEP. The special education providers will ensure that students are provided accommodations and specially designed instruction in both settings as well. Question was asked, how can you provide an IP service if my child is following the remote approach? All services for students who are participating in virtual learning will participate in telepractice and teletherapy modes of instruction. Students will have access to their special education teachers, case managers, related service providers on a regular basis based on their individual needs outlined on their IEP. As the school year begins, case managers will be reaching out to work with families on specific schedules. I know there's a lot more questions in terms of instruction, and our hope is to provide this information to you on our website under the Frequently Asked Questions section as they come to fruition. Thank you, Mr. Milligan. Thank you, Mr. Zinkovich. I, uh, we know that's a lot of information, and, and you still probably have questions. Um, as a reminder, principals and directors will continue to reach out to parents, and if at any time you have a question, please be sure to reach out to your building principal. Uh, at this time, I would ask that Corey Allen provide us a quick summary of how we will work through the questions that you have been putting into the chat room up here um, in the Zoom. Again, we will collect all the questions and we'll combine them with our other frequently asked questions on the web page that we looked at earlier. And to be respectful of your time, um, we were hoping to have about 20 minutes, but it looks like we got just under 30 questions. Uh, some of them are similar, so if we're able to get through, all of them today, this will be our first group that we've been able to do that with. So, um, Mr. Allen, do you want to um, uh, get us started? Absolutely. Thank you once again for submitting your thoughtful questions. Uh, we're going to go through these one by one. And, and if you do not hear us answer your question, it's quite possibly because it's very similar to another question, and we'll do our best in the time allotted. So going with the first question, I was wondering if a child kept home due to potential COVID symptoms or any other reason, will be able to follow the remote learning schedule and check in with their teachers in a way that they will be best be absent and have to catch up the next time they're in those classes. So essentially, so, will, will a student staying out due to COVID symptoms be able to touch base with their students, their teacher remotely? Correct, if it's for extended period of time, we may ultimately move those students to the remote group and they will have access similar to their peers at that grade level. In terms of the question, will families be notified if their assigned teachers are taking a leave of absence and a sub will be in their place? We'll follow our normal, normal protocols. For instance, if there's a maternity leave, principals text typically just notify parents of a change and announce the new teacher that we've hired them to serve as a substitute teacher. Is there a good question around snow days and how they will be handled? Um, if we do have snow days, that will help us with moving our conference days to the beginning of the year and we will most likely have remote learning on that day to count it as an attendance day. But similar to last year, like we did with spring break, uh, I'm sure it'll be some kind of modified, um, uh, you know, um, program with asynchronous learning. 
Another question asking, are we not cross-contaminating by having the blue group, um, the blue group Monday, Thursday, and the gold group Tuesday, Friday? Jonathan? So I don't believe we are cross-contaminating because we will be conducting a deep clean of the, of the classrooms and the building every evening. Um, in the same vein, some districts are doing on a Wednesday. Instead of doing it just on a Wednesday, we will, we will be doing it every evening. And there won't be, there should be uh, less risk of any cross contamination. Thank you, Jonathan. The CDC defines COVID symptoms as things such as a runny nose. Are we to assume that any type of child has, any time a child has a runny nose or a typical mild cold like symptom, they will be quarantined and sent home? I think this uh, falls in line with a lot of the questions that we get around uh, being symptomatic of any illness and, and having those symptoms be consistent with COVID 19. Uh, this is obviously a, an area of discussion that our local providers are having as well. Um, but again, the, the guidance is pretty clear, right? That if we do not have documentation of a pre existing condition, we cannot prove that those symptoms are not COVID 19 and that we need to take the appropriate steps, have the child see the physician, uh, receive a, a negative COVID screen, and then also have symptom resolution. Thank you, Mr. O'Connor. It was stated that the buses were balanced as best we could. Are our children going to be safe on buses? So our transportation department is currently routing all of the students on the buses. Based on the guidance we have, we are able to seat uh, approximately 20 to 22 students on the buses, um, each with students wearing their masks and socially distant. Um, the students will be also, besides masks, the buses will run with windows open if it is above 45 degrees. In addition to that, the drivers will be uh, disinfecting and cleaning seats and the bus itself after each morning route and after each evening route, um, as well as disinfecting with the Protexas electrostatic sprayer twice a week. So we believe of the cleaning protocols that we have play in place will keep students safe. Thank you. Very much. Two on uh, do, quality of the video. Do the non-hybrid students have a have to complete the health screening? Is this also a way of taking attendance? At this point, at the onset of the school year, students who are completely remote will not need to take the healthcare screening unless, of course, they are coming on to the campus for another reason. Uh, so, just for instance, if you were able to open up uh, with some more normalcy in the future. At that point, students coming onto campus, all students coming onto campus, would need to fill out the screener. We have a question: Will we be will we be asked to pay the insurance for our device uh, for our child in elementary school? As Mr. Zinkovich indicated. No, students or uh, parents at K-5 will not be responsible for signing up for insurance. Question, if I indicated that I will that I will be driving my child each day, will will there be a, excuse me, will he or she be assigned to a bus route in case of emergencies? Um, if you've indicated that you uh, know the student would not be um, routed on the bus route, uh, we are trying to route for a little extra capacity in case of emergencies. However, that would need to be discussed between the building principal and the transportation department. Thank you. What happens if a parent does not complete the morning screen that is emailed or texted to them in the morning? Is the child sent home? Uh, that is a, a great question, a question that comes up uh, in, the, in the guidance quite frequently. Uh, I think part of our responsibility as a district is to train uh, parents on completing that screening. And ideally that, that, health, that daily health screening should be completed at home. Um, conversely, we also know that there could be instances where students come to school without having that screen completed. And there will be policies and procedures in place at each building level uh, to have trained staff on site, including our school nurses, to complete uh, that daily health screen on behalf of our students. Question, oh, sorry, a question was asked in regards to the hybrid model. Will the students working from home receive synchronous or asynchronous synchronous learning or both? Uh, the, the response is both. Uh, they'll have an opportunity in each 
each level is a little bit different and our hope is to plan the specific details next week and to relay that to our families next week, uh, but they'll have an opportunity for both. Uh, questions, families that have more than one student, if they're currently remote, but choose to go hybrid in October, will they still be able to keep that household the same group, either blue or gold? The answer is yes. We wanna keep families together in order to make it more convenient for their fit parents. Uh, I know students will be using lockers at the middle school. There are quite a few supplies or students expected to bring these to and from school each day. There's a possible way supply list might be reduced. Yes, we're trying to uh, reduce the supply list. Uh, we want to minimize the amount of uh, extra um, supplies that students carry with them each day or utilize each day. We're hoping that students will rely on their laptops. Although when they are in person under the hybrid model, we want to minimize the amount of technology that they use. Uh, but we, overall, we're trying to minimize supplies. Question of, will a high schooler be able to change their schedule without switching their hybrid group? I think that, um, so in, in, a, in a traditional, yeah, in a, in a traditional year, uh, changing schedules uh, at the high school level is, is uh, sometimes a, a puzzle. Uh, I think there's a, an added layer of complexity when we add in the blue and gold groups. However, we have an, obviously a very talented team of, of counselors. Uh, so if you do have that question about uh, switching a schedule once the school year it starts, uh, the advice would be to work with your administrator and the counselors at the building level uh, to see what can be accommodated. The, uh, the questions around picking up the children after school, if you chose not to use the bus, uh, the elementary principals are uh, working together to have a common process and it really each building's a little bit different uh, because of the layout of the buildings but probably some sort of staggered schedule for parents coming in uh, because of the number of parents asking for that. Uh, again it's a work in progress but we'll get information out. I believe Mr. Zinkowitz said as soon as possible next week or, or the week after. So the question was asked what measures will be put in place while the students are traveling throughout the hallway to different classes uh, at the high school level. Um, as you know, our high school periods are 80 minutes in length. Uh, traditionally, we have an advisement period. Uh, we are suspending advisement until further notice, and we're gonna utilize that time to extend the amount of passing time that students have in between their classes. Our hope is to possibly stagger when students are released from their class to go to their next class period in order to minimize the amount of traffic in the halls. We'll also have supervised hallways and students will be encouraged because they won't have access to their lockers to travel to their next class. Question in regards to will there be anything done for band students who are completely remote? For our band students that are completely remote, uh, those would be more individualized lessons with their music teacher. Did, uh, Mr. Did you talk to Mr. McCabe about the cut passes? A uh, question, how much of each remote day will be synchronous learning? Uh, and that's going to vary from level to level. Uh, we're still finalizing some of the details, and our plan is to release the specific information next week. Question in regards to uh, remote and hybrid group will have different, will they have different teachers? Will the remote? Yes, uh, there's a possibility um, at the elementary level that if you switch from hybrid, sorry, from remote to hybrid, that you may have a different teacher. A class at the secondary level will remain intact. You know, Cosgrove will continue to have 50 minute class periods and the high school will continue to have 80 minute class periods. In terms of will students be following their schedules on remote days, do they need to log in to class live? Uh, once again, the students will have that option either to follow through a synchronous model or based on convenience, they can always log into school at a later time and pick up the lesson of what they miss. Question in regards to substitute teachers in multiple buildings and what to do if the, the substitutes are diagnosed with COVID-like symptoms. So with this question, I think we go back to relying on the Monroe County Department of Health, uh, excuse me, the Monroe County Department of Health um, and follow their lead in terms of um, uh, contact tracing and, and, and action plans. I think it's also 
important to remember that close contact right now is, is defined by uh, the state Department of Health are those individuals who are within six feet of each other for 15 minutes at a time or longer and unmasked. So there's a question about transportation training for our new kindergartners who've never been on a bus before. Those dates that I mentioned earlier for kindergarten orientation, which will be held on Thursday, September 10th and Friday, September 11th, a bus will be on site at each one of our elementary schools and a portion of that orientation will involve students getting on, sitting down on the bus, and then getting off the bus. For students driving themselves and possibly friends to school, are there any rules for parking spaces and coming in and out from the parking lot? Those are one of those items that uh, the high school team will post on the website uh, in order to provide some additional information and guidance to our students. Uh, that first two days of school for both our blue and gold students, uh, we'll be going through all the safety protocols in terms of what the expectations are in order to ensure that our, safe, our students are safe and healthy. So is there any aspect of the daily screener that pertains to the home exposure to COVID positive individuals or home contacts that are symptomatic but not tested to account for the asymptomatic, excuse me, asymptomatic carriers? Yes, one of the questions of the uh, screener is, have you been in contact with someone who's pet tested positive or displays COVID-like symptoms? question we're, about we're looking at a few questions here that are probably going to be better answered by the principals next week because there's just some things we're working on with them so uh, if you don't hear your question read that's one of the reasons why in terms of supplies um, you're going to receive, uh, families will receive notification either in the portal or from a letter from the principals that have information about supply lists. Once again, we're trying to minimize and streamline the amount of things that families will need to purchase that ultimately students will then bring into school. So we are moving into the district shortly after school year. We will be transporting up until that time. How quickly will my child be able to be assigned to a bus route and how quickly will it take effect? Uh, it, it should take effect very quickly, but we are routing for a little extra capacity, um, but we are limited by the number of students on the bus. I would suggest contacting the transportation department and give them your information in advance so that they can consider routing your student if it's going to be that close to the beginning of the school year. If we did not receive a laptop last year for our child, but we'll need one this year, is there a process on the website to do this? Students who did not receive a laptop last year, but need one this year, will receive one um, on the dependent upon grade level, the first day of in-person instruction. Uh, if it's at uh, K-5, K, student grade K, they will receive that during orientation, as will our freshman students. Again, this goes back to the uh, plan of deployment that will be released from each building. A uh, question just asked about um, teachers rotating between classes. Um, at the elementary level, students will remain in their classroom and their special area teachers will report to that room and provide art, music, etc. Does that teachers will also report to the classroom? However, they will then escort their students outside, hopefully, or to other large areas where social distancing can occur. At the secondary level, students will be able to travel from class to class. Okay. I think we're good. Um, we ran a couple minutes over. There's only a few questions that we didn't get to, but again, uh, we were trying to look at those that were similar questions or ones that we know our principals will be addressing next week or with phone calls. So uh, this has been very helpful for us and we thank you again. Uh, thank the panelists that are here with me today and um, them helping us uh, address the questions. Uh, 
as a reminder, the uh, final forum we will have is next week on Wednesday the 26th. Again, that's the one with the principals. We'd like you to join us again if you can make that one. And thank you again today for joining us. We appreciate your questions, feedback, and patience as we prepare for the upcoming school year. Uh, we know that school will look different this year, but please know that the health and safety of our students, staff, and families is and will continue to be our top priority. You can continue to submit questions, as you can see on the, on the slideshow here, at info at um, or, or contact your building principal um, with grade-specific or student-specific questions. So uh, thank you very, very much, everyone. We appreciate it. We hope you have a nice evening. And uh, keep an eye on that frequently asked uh, question page on our website. Thank you.